So I'm going to kick it right off. Uh, our program today, the enemy, uh, the enemy Among Us POWs in Missouri during World War II, is being presented by Mr. David Fiedler. Mr. Fiedler lives in St. Louis with his family. He works full time with the headquarters of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, where he is president of the LCMS Foundation. Dave attended Washington University and was an officer in the United States Army. Thank you for your service. For his work related to the POWs, Dave received the Governor's Award for the Humanities. His first exposure to the POWs came in a dusty corner of a museum at Fort Leonard Wood when he stumbled upon some black and white photos of German soldiers working in a Missouri field. The photos piqued his interest and his research began. During World War II, more than 15,000 German and Italian soldiers came to Missouri and were held in many different camps scattered throughout the state. It was an amazing time that was largely positive for all involved. The camps were relatively pleasant places, and in fact, the government was sometimes criticized for treating the prisoners too well. Mr. Fiedler has extensively researched this fascinating chapter of Missouri history, and he will share photographs and stories for those who experienced it firsthand. He tells of the fascinating yet little-known story of when the POWs came to Missouri and how residents reacted when they came face-to-face -face with the enemy. Please join me in welcoming David Fiedler. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me here. Uh, Dr. McCaffrey, I appreciate it. I appreciate you for being here uh, as well. And hey, what a great lunch, right? I'm not saying I'm going to skip Thanksgiving, but this was a brilliant preview. So by virtue of you being here today, you may have some interest in this topic. And you heard in the, in the nice introduction that I, like about 90% of the other people uh, in Missouri or you know in other states that had prisoners of war, really had no idea that this incredible story took place. I mean, if you think about it, 15,000 enemy soldiers, right? Germans and Italians, right here in Missouri. And 90% of people have never heard about this. Yet, there's 10% who say, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, they worked on Uncle Harry's farm. Or, I was talking to Steve from Festus on the way in, and he said, well sure, you know, I had a neighbor who served as a translator with the Italians at that camp in Weingarten. So it's this interesting contrast of a very large, very successful program, but yet one that's really not widely known, either back then or today. But we'll work our way through it. We'll have a chance for some questions at the end. Given where we are here, there's probably some people who have those connections and a chance to uh, also talk about their contact with it, because between St. Genevieve, St. Francis, Jefferson County, there was a strong presence of the prisoner of war uh, here in this area, and that's what we'll talk about today. So the first question is, why did they end up here in the first place, right? I mean, when you think of World War II, it's over in Europe, it's in the Pacific, it's in North Africa. Yet to end up with 15,000 prisoners of war here and over 400,000 in the United States. And yes, this was a nationwide program. Uh, just about every state in the country had prisoners of war uh, eventually working in camps, uh, living in camps, working on farms, or in logging, or in mining, or whatever the local industry would be. You know, 350,000 Germans across our country, 70,000 Italians, so this was a, a big, big project. How did they get here? Why did they get here? If you think about it, <clears throat> World War II essentially started in 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. So more than two years elapsed between that time and when Pearl Harbor took place. But France and Britain had already been in it for much of that time. And so they had prisoners of war in their countries that they had captured. And so they were really overrun. They're getting to the point where they were over capacity for what they could manage. And so uh, you had Germans like this, uh, or Italians like this captured in North Africa, Germans being captured in Europe, and so, just as soon as the United States got into the war, we agreed to begin helping our allies by taking these prisoners of war off their hands and relieving some of that pressure. So starting early in the spring of 1942, prisoners of war began coming to the United States at the rate of 50,000, 75,000 a month. And, you know, how did they get here? If you think about it, there were ships that were constantly going back and forth between the United States and Europe 
hauling our men and equipment, other military supplies, and they would be coming back empty for the most part. So it was easy to bring prisoners of war here that way. They established new processing camps on the East Coast in New York and Virginia where they were received and then sent across the country by rail. And as the government thought about where they were going to locate these camps, they said, you know, these are dangerous men. We need to put them in places that are far away from largely populated areas, far away from the coasts or the borders of Canada and Mexico to reduce the temptation for escape. And so given those things, Missouri seemed like a brilliant choice. And it was. And the government's uh, options right off the bat were to establish, were to put these prisoners of war on what were, for the most part, already established military bases. So if you can see uh, that, that chart, I know some of you in the back may be a little bit tough, but those yellow stars represent Fort Leonard Wood in the middle of the state, right? An existing military facility that they then put the prisoner of war camp on. And there were 5,000 prisoners of war, Germans, at Fort Leonard Wood because they typically wouldn't mix them by nationality. Camp Clark in Nevada, Missouri, and Camp Crowder also held Germans. And they held 4,000 and 3,000 prisoners of war, respectively. And then, of course, very close to where we are right now, Camp Weingarten in Weingarten, Missouri, on Highway 32 between St. Genevieve and Farmington, was built specifically to be a prisoner of war camp and specifically to hold Italians with a capacity of about 5,600. So, you know, if you think about most of the sizes of towns in Missouri those days, right, 5,600 prisoners of war, that would be a big establishment. And you would have at least another thousand Americans needing to run the place. So these became pretty sophisticated and pretty complex developments. This is what the prisoner of war camp would look like. A tall fence, double row of uh, eight foot fence around the outside with uh, guard towers and searchlights. I know this will be really tough to see, but there is a guy in the middle with his foot up on the rail and he's holding a rifle. There was a searchlight around the top and a 50 caliber machine gun inside that could rotate in any direction because they were concerned about keeping these prisoners of war in place. Military police on horseback and with guard dogs would patrol because, again, our government wasn't sure just what kind of situation this would be in terms of are these men going to be dangerous and try to kill people and blow things up and, you know, how closely must we really guard them? Um, but as you'll hear, as time went on, fortunately that concern uh, never materialized. In terms of the camps themselves, they, had, they looked identical to our U.S. Army soldiers' uh, barracks. The United States was very particular about observing uh, the rules established in the Geneva Convention. You've probably heard that uh, the Geneva Conference, it's also called after World War I, basically governments agreed on how prisoners of war should be treated. The basic premise was, you treat the prisoners the same way you do your own soldiers, in terms of their housing accommodations, in terms of the food that they eat, uh, and all those types of things. And so the barracks were identical to what our own soldiers stayed in. They were single-story barracks like these ones you see here. This photograph is taken at Camp Weingarten in St. Genevieve County, or two-story barracks like they had at Fort Leonard Wood. And anybody that was in the military from World War II really through about 15 or 20 years ago, has stayed in barracks like that. Uh, Two-story, open bay, um, and you know, these, these were not, it's not the Ritz-Carlton, but for the prisoners of war, it was a lot better than maybe what they expected, right? They had come from the battlefield, not necessarily eating hot meals, but here, you know, the, the proverbial three squares a day and running water, hot water at that, and so it turned out to be a pretty comfortable existence. This is the interior of the barracks um, at Camp Crowder down in southwest Missouri. It's down around Joplin. Uh, there's a dog there in the middle. Can you see him kind of up on his paws like that? So the prisoners were allowed to have, have pets. Think about that for a moment, right? Uh, there's curtains in the windows, light fixture on the ceiling, nice quilts, little bedside tables. And again, far better than what the prisoners expected when they came, right? You get captured and who knows what kind of uh, situation this is going to be. But it was a, a very comfortable um, opportunity. Now, it wasn't just sitting around all day and living the life of luxury. The Geneva Convention also said that you could require prisoners to work. You couldn't put them into anything that was too directly related to the war effort. 
It couldn't be harmful or dangerous to them. And get this, you had to pay them for their labor. Think about that. You know, they're here as prisoners of war, you know, doing these kinds of tasks, and they're collecting $10 an hour. Sorry, Woo. that'd be a, uh, just checking, everybody paying attention there? 10 cents an hour, uh, or you know, 80 cents a day, roughly a dollar a day, somewhere between 20 or $30 a month, about what our own U.S. Army privates were receiving. And that could be socked away into savings accounts that they would be cashed out after the war, or could be spent in the camp store. And again, uh, that rule about you have to make available for the prisoners generally what your own soldiers have, so they could buy chocolate or you know, tobacco or stationery or whatever they want. <coughs> the biggest part of the prisoners' work, especially early on, was in the upkeep of these camps themselves. Because if you think about it, if you have 5,000 prisoners of war, there's just a great big need for ordinary things like barbers or bakers or to work in the laundry or to work in the mess hall. These guys here, you see this picture, this is Camp Crowder. Our, it's a trash crew, right? They've got a truck, they're going around, they're emptying trash cans. You see their daily uniform. These were holdovers from the Great Depression work programs. It's a pair of like denim uh, coveralls that have PW uh, stenciled on the back and on the front side, of course, for prisoners of war. And so they did all kinds of things. This is a, a line, you know, stonework on a creek that flowed through uh, Camp Crowder. Um, you had, I mentioned the mess halls. So one of the things that the government did was pretty smart was it realized, you know, the, the whole rule about feed the prisoners the same as you do your own soldiers, that was fine, but when you had Italian prisoners of war and were giving them hot dogs and jello and canned corn and stuff like that, there was a lot of waste. And, and you know, government thinkers said maybe we can minimize waste and just help the situation generally. Let's, let's give them flour for pasta and olive oil and garlic and tomato paste and let them cook with it. Can you imagine if you're an American GI and you see the uh, US servicemen mess hall over here with hot dogs and corn and jello, <laughs> or you've got the prisoners of war with lasagna or you know, whatever, they, you know, they're constantly being chased out of their barracks. So this is Camp Weingarten, prisoners of war, not only feeding themselves, but operating the mess halls um, that served the American trainees that were going through. Uh, they worked in the motor pool uh, at Camp Weingarten. You know, medical, medical people are always in short supply. So you would have doctors or dentists or x-ray techs. You know, they would put them work in, a, in medical facilities to treat their own prisoners of war. And that was a, that was a good deal for everybody. So the point is, this wasn't just, let's make up stuff, let's make up dumb jobs to keep people busy. This was legitimate work that people uh, not only felt productive doing, but it helped us a lot, and either would have gone undone or would have required Americans to do. Just even things like, you know, scraping paint and uh, putting a new layer of paint on, on doors around the place. I mentioned pay. You know, they weren't, they weren't handed cash or currency, right? It was either these coupons that could be used in the camp store or um, credit to an account to spend to spend later. Um, one of the controversies that came up, you know, I talked about the barracks not being the Ritz-Carlton, but being pretty nice. The accommodations for the, the menu, these items in the camp store, you know, chocolate and you know, cologne and things like that. Let's, let's imagine you and me live outside of one of these camps. And this is the days of rationing, right? Butter and eggs and milk are in short supply. We're not getting chocolate bars. But yet, on the other side of the fence in the prisoner of war camp, this stuff is taking place. And the government got caught up in a big storm of criticism, as you might imagine. They said, what, what are we doing? Are we running country clubs here? This is our enemy. These people were shooting at us just not very long ago. Why do we want to pamper them? Why do we want to you know, go overboard with this nice, nice stuff? And that was a difficult thing to explain. Um, you know, the government, again, was serious about upholding the Geneva Convention, um, and also they knew that the treatment of the prisoners of war here, believe it or not, had a direct effect on the treatment of our own prisoners of war uh, in German hands. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the, what, our, what our servicemen experienced uh, at the hands of the Japanese was a different deal, and there were incredible atrocities that took place there. Um, but you know, the United States was very particular about this, and, and the camps were inspected by the Swiss government and the International Red Cross and things like that. And so we were very diligent about upholding these high 
uh, standards for treatment. And also we said even though we know it's not always reciprocated, we're not going to get uh, you know, stampede it down just because it's, it's not necessarily being done the other way. And then the big picture thing, this is really hard to measure or explain. Our government realized that we had these prisoners of war for a fairly short period of time. Um, you know, they came, the first one's in the spring of 1942. Uh, they went home beginning in 1940, late 1945 or 1946. So the longest would have been about four years. They said, this is our opportunity to educate on what life in a free society is like, what it looks like to work in a democracy, and you know, hopefully these men can go back to their countries and help be involved in reestablishing democratic governments and free society over there. Did it work? You know, is it, is it hard to measure? It's hard to measure, but you know, in the course of researching this book, I talked to um, any number of people, you know, former prisoners of war who you know, spoke with great respect for the United States and gratitude um, and, and surprise and appreciation for what they experienced while they were here as prisoners of war. Because again, you know, you're, you're captured, you're not sure what kind of hand you're going to get dealt. And to come here and be treated fairly, to be able to work, and, and you're not beaten or starved, uh, was an incredible, incredible relief. There were stories where, you know, people from home would want to send their son you know, here's, here's a box of cookies, we're thinking about you. And, and they'd write back, Mom, you know, keep the cookies, I'm putting on weight here as it is. <laughs> so, you know, just, a, just a, a nod to what, how that all played out. Now, um, what's, what kind of traces are left of the prisoners of war in their, their time here today? Um, there's stonework, this is at Fort Leonard Wood, this was built by some of the German prisoners of war. If you walk around the camp, you know, you see examples of the work that they built. You can see it at Jefferson Barracks, too. Um, culverts, that, uh, that stonework that lined the ditch, uh, this is a culvert at Fort Leonard Wood. There in the middle, you know, they left uh, a reminder who built that. PW, <coughs> Prisoners of War, and the date is August 25th of 1943. So, uh, next August, who's good at math? That'll be 80, 80 years here, real quick, right? And so those kinds of traces are around. This says Fort Leonard Wood, German POW, 1945. Some of you may have seen this before. If you drive through Wine Garden, um, there's the old train tracks that run through town, and uh, one of the houses there has this in the backyard. It's a large stone fireplace that was attached to the officers' club. Uh, there's those pillars, those were the supports. When you saw that single-story barracks in the picture early on, that's what it sat on, and that fireplace is there in the backyard. But other than those physical traces, there's not, not tons that are left, uh, you know, that, that marks what, what um, you know, evidence of, their, of the prisoners and their time here. If you're in Wine Garden, as I mentioned, uh, there's still some old, you know, you just very faintly in the, in the field see traces of roads. There was a cemetery at one point, a very small cemetery. <laughs> That's no more, but there's just not a lot left. So, <clears throat> to kind of shift gears here a little bit, you know, I talked about 15,000 prisoners of war all across the state, um, in you know, little towns and side by side with people. But so far, we've only heard about these four big camps, um, and the government being so serious about guarding them early on. Something happened to move these prisoners of war from these four big camps to little camps all across the state and you know, put them face to face with ordinary Missourians and lots of interaction uh, with people going about their day to day business. And that was, anybody recognize this? Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. And, and Rosie the Riveter represents all the American women who went to work in defense plants and munitions factories and things like that to help replace the men who had been called off to war. You know, a similar labor shortage existed in agriculture but there weren't the same you know, army of Rosies ready to go to work in the fields just because of population. And so our government was looking at an incredible, incredible labor shortage in 1943. And it was serious enough that uh, agriculture that had been put in in the spring was gonna rot in the fields in the fall because there was nobody to harvest it. And so they thought a lot about it. They said, these prisoners of war are working inside these camps. It's going pretty well, right? There's not a lot of fights. They're not trying to escape. They're generally doing good work. There was very limited um, forays into the areas right outside the camp, but that was sort of um, restricted just by transportation and logistics. And so um, what the government said is maybe we can use these prisoners of war 
outside these big camps in, in areas you know farther flung that their, their work is greater needed. And so, what well, they hemmed in Haw, though. What if, what if just even one incident, so somebody escaping? What if something gets blown up or somebody gets killed? It's going to send everybody in a panic. And so, it really it was sort of a period of indecision. But what finally forced it was this. And that's heavy spring flooding in, the, in 1943. Uh, the rivers were up, both the Missouri and the Mississippi. And little towns all up and down these rivers were getting washed out, including St. Genevieve. I mean, acres and acres of farmland, underwater, buildings getting destroyed, and there was no end in sight and no immediate uh, options for help until somebody said, hey, what about these Italian prisoners of war that we just brought to Weingarten two weeks before? Can we use them? If they all run off, if they don't do what they're supposed to, we're not going to be in any worse shape. we got to try it. And so they brought them into St. Genevieve. This is the picture of, of St. Gen. Uh, the prisoners of war are lined up across the middle of the, uh, of the picture there, and they organized them into sandbag brigades, and they worked for 36 hours straight, filling sandbags, passing them down the line, reinforcing the levee, and they held the floodwaters off. Hooray. Hooray for St. Genevieve. Hooray for us, said the Army. You know, this may actually work. And everybody, all these farmers and, and co-ops and the ag the groups that desperately needed work, Hooray for us, this might actually work, and we'll get some labor that we need to help uh, you know, this, alleviate this shortage. And so that began uh, what was known as the branch camp program. That took these prisoners of war, all clustered in these four big camps and large, large groups, and put them all across the state in little towns, uh, in little camps, with really much less formal arrangements, and put the prisoners face to face with ordinary, ordinary Missourians. You see clusters in uh, southeast Missouri in the boot heel, uh, soybeans and cotton, central Missouri uh, in Columbia, and Fulton and Sedalia was uh, corn, over near Kansas City was potatoes, St. Louis, uh, Jefferson Barracks, and, and uh, some of the farms along the west in Chesterfield in Missouri River bottoms going toward St. Charles. And so all of a sudden you had prisoners of war in all these little camps. And you know what had been such really a, a if, if, if you know they were known such a frightening thing, what well, you know these must be dangerous men, right? They're locked up behind the fences and guard dogs and searchlights and everything else. All of a sudden, didn't look quite so threatening. You had a, a, these are Italians in a truck on their way to work in the potato fields near Independence, and they're singing and they're waving, and you know all of a sudden it's you know, baby face, you know some young guys, 18 years old, and. You know, who had ever seen somebody actually from Italy at that point? It was such a novelty. These gals, you know, wanted to have a picture taken with them. So I uh, mentioned Weingarten. The government realized that in central Missouri was a big opportunity. There was a hybrid, big hybrid seed corn operation. And if you know anything about that, a big part of that work is detasseling the corn in the middle of the, the summer. And it is hot work, and it's labor intensive, and they didn't have anybody to do it. But they offered the opportunity uh, to the Italians at Weingarten, who were at that point bored, silly, and they welcomed the opportunity to get out, to be active, to do some work, and see some things. And so um, these Italians were one of the first work groups in a formal arrangement to leave Camp Weingarten. And this was, um, you know, groundbreaking on a national basis, right? They, they were trying to figure out this problem all across the country. And so to have that really happen here to show it could work, this, this was revolutionary. So one of the things that um, either the government or the, the local ag association had to figure out was where to actually house them, right? It wasn't the barracks lined up, dressed right, dressed like you'd see at Fort Leonard Wood or Camp Crowder or wherever else. In these situations, they put them anywhere they could. So in Columbia, um, you know, you try to think about what's available in the summertime. And so this was the Sigma Phi Epsilon Prisoner of War Camp. <laughs> You know, the fraternity house was standing open, right? Most of the college students, the males, were off at war. The mortgage doesn't stop on a fraternity house. It was close enough to all the fields that they were working in, and so these Italians were housed for uh, six weeks in the summer of 1943 and 1944 in Colombia. And, you know, if there was a fence around the fraternity house, it was largely symbolic. Can you imagine the attraction this was for kids in the neighborhood? And for the Italians, too. They had kids at home, and so before you knew it, there's gum being passed through the fence and 
A professor from Mizzou figured if they were from Italy, they must like opera. So he set up a record player on the sidewalk that's playing opera music for them. Um, they were allowed, you know, we, we speaking about the United States, um, were, were good. Uh, and allowing them opportunities for recreation, uh, religious involvement. You know, they participated in work, uh, in uh, worship, and actually chorale uh, stuff at the Catholic, uh, at the parish in Columbia. The prisoners went to movies, downtown Columbia. I had the opportunity to talk with one of the Italians who was there in 1943. And he recalls his time and things like that, where, um, you know, the most special part of his stay here you know, he talks about going to see movies in that movie theater, some of the really early Disney animated films. And what he remembers is not so much what was on the screen, but it was sitting in the darkness and hearing the laughter of the children, or being able to sing in that church. And he wrote to me, you know, of all the things in his uh, time here, the biggest thing was that the people in Columbia, he said, treated me like a human being. And so it's that kind of recollection um, and sentiment that came out of this that really stuck with people for decades uh, after the war. Those interactions happened uh, everywhere. Um, this is in St. Louis. Uh, these four uh, Germans were hired to work um, on a farm there and you know what's grown up now uh, that had been more rural at that point. And a farmer named Wagner needed people to help him fix up a barn and tend to an orchard. He had bought this property and had been neglected. And so he didn't need friends, right? He wasn't looking for getting new friends out of the deal. He needed help for his operation. And so every day he'd go out to Chesterfield and pick these guys up and they'd work and he'd take them back. But over the course of the time together, they became friends. And this mutual respect and affection grew up to the point where after the war, or when it was time for them to go home, they traded addresses. And Mr. Wagner in particular, uh, wrote letters with the man in the white jumpsuit there in the middle named Nicholas Pauscher. And if you know uh, about the World War II history, as World War II ended, it was a terrible winter in Europe. Like winter going from 1945 to 46. Bitterly cold, fuel shortages, starvation, it was an awful time. And in researching this book, I sat in the living room of this, well it was a farmhouse at that time, uh, with Mr. Pau uh, Mr. Wagner's son, and he showed me a box of letters that Nicholas Pauscher had written his dad. And they were bound in a red ribbon, and it's that crinkly airmail paper that's so thin you can almost see through. And it was things like, Dear Mr. Wagner, thank you for the package of food that you sent us last week. It's been a desperate time here, and that has really helped us make it through. Another one said, Thank you for the winter coat that you sent my wife. It's a perfect size for her and like a gift from heaven. So to have that kind of thing come out of this, I think it's pretty special. When you know they, these, these men came here as our enemies, um, but very positive things uh, came out of it at times as a result. Fortunately, you know, and, and after a couple of years, the the letters got less exciting, right? It became the kinds of things that you maybe send people that you know that live farther away. Wedding announcements for their kids and Christmas cards and things like that, and that continued until uh, Mr. Pauscher died in the 1990s. One more thing, we talked about Christmas cards. Uh, this is a birthday card. It might not look like one, but this belongs, a, a woman named Dora McDonald shared this with me. She lives in Nevada, which is down, uh, again, also southwest Missouri near Camp Clark. And it's a letter that four prisoner of war employees at the sewage disposal plant wrote her husband. He was their boss at the time. And it said, we congratulate you, Mr. McDonald, on your birthday today and wish you good luck for the future. And it's got their names, Carl, Fritz, Wolfgang, and Kurt. And, you know, there's a couple things I think of when I look at that. One is that these prisoners of war, English is not their native language, right? I picture them sitting together on the steps of the barracks, trying to think of the right way to say, happy birthday, Mr. McDonald, you know, our boss at Camp Clark. And you can maybe see there's some crinkles in it. It's been folded and unfolded uh, countless times over the years. I think of what this means to Dora McDonald, again, uh, his, his widow. And, you know, she cherishes that because to her, it reminds her of her husband and uh, the gentleman he was and, and, you know, the way he treated these men as well and, and what they thought of him. So, uh, despite all the, the, the zillion terrible things that came out of World War II or any war, uh, the positive things uh, did, did result. 
So you've heard a lot about work and the interaction that uh, the prisoners of war had with people across Missouri. They had opportunities for fun as well. Uh, sports were a big part of the, the way they spent their free time. This is a soccer team at Fort Leonard Wood. They've got their uniforms. There's a trophy there in the middle. They won a camp tournament. And so they, they just about anything with a ball they could have uh, any sort of competition was, was big. This is the library at Camp Crowder. Uh, that was a way prisoners could spend time too. There was books and magazines and newspapers, not only in their native language, but in English. There were courses that were offered that could be taken that would count for credit, literally back home, uh, much like a, a university course. And uh, you know, there were prisoners who came with this expertise enough to teach the classes, that became their jobs. You'd have theater groups and musical groups. This is at Camp Weingarten, uh, an ensemble that would play uh, at dances and stuff that they would have there at the camp. The prisoners could use the money that they made uh, to buy instruments, or they were donated by the Red Cross the instruments were, uh, or by you know various religious groups. Um, they would put on vaudeville type shows for themselves um, or for you know American audiences where you'd have mus uh, musicians and magicians and jugglers and acrobats and all that type of thing. Of course, you had to had to be creative and improvise when needed. I don't know if you can see that just gorgeous gal there on the left. Um, you know that's a that's a German prisoner of war as well. And the live entertainment was a, a big deal in those days, so these were always very popular. And, uh, fun and creative outlet for the prisoners as well. Artwork was possible. Um, this is uh, this was done at Camp White Garden, the carpentry shop, and hangs in somebody's living room today. The prisoners gave it to their father, who was the the, the supervisor of their work. Uh, the prisoners were entrepreneurs as well. They would take a little black and white wallet-sized photo of somebody's wife or girlfriend, and uh, you know from it create a, a full-size, full-color, you know, often oil or watercolor painting, and you know, you could barter for chocolate or, or cigarettes or whatever. Toothpaste tubes in those days were lead. I don't know if you know that or remember that, but they would melt them down and, and sort of mold these little imitation metals. And uh, you know, you could give it to some GI who was a, a worker at the camp, and he'd show the folks back home how he had captured these battle medallions off the, off the main Germans. <laughs> Little bits of wood uh, and metal could be used to forge something like that. That's a, a model Navy ship that was done by one of the Italians. Or on a larger scale, uh, again, I know this is tough to see, but this is a model village that was built in the barracks, uh, in the space between the barracks at Camp Crowder. There's a church here in the uh, mid-upper right. There's a mill pond. It had electric lights that went on and off, a little train that went round and around. Uh, the mill wheels spun. And it just goes to show you what they can do with free time and creativity and uh, access to just uh, kind of scraps you could patch together for something like that. Now, how does the story end? Were the prisoners allowed to stay and just sort of become Americans? The answer was no. The government was very clear from the start that when the war was over, the prisoners were going back home. The route that they took varied, though, depending on what nationality they were. If you remember, Italy uh, surrendered midway through, uh, left the alliance with the Axis powers, and joined up with the US and Britain and France. And that gave us this big question of, we've got 70,000 Italians that had been enemy soldiers. You know, are, are they, what, what, do you, what do we do with them? And the answer was to create special Italian military units that operated directly under the control of the United States. So beginning in the spring of 1944, this is uh, Italians wearing new uniforms, a marching band, they're leaving Camp Weingarten, they're headed out, there's behind the flag, they're headed toward the depot, and they're on their way to these new assignments. So, you know, they worked in those roles essentially through the end of the war, and in the September of 1945, uh, the Italians began returning home. By January 1946, with the cessation of hostilities, uh, they were all basically back home. For the Germans, it was a different deal. This is uh, the Italians. Um, they basically wore U.S. Army uniforms with the Green Italy patch, like you see there uh, on, on the sleeve. For the Germans, it was a different deal. You know, there was none of this business of, uh, we'll just let you go loose and, and have work and do your own thing, even after the war was done, right? It's September 1945, and they were maybe starting to think about going home. And we said, wait, you know, hold it not so fast. There's 400. You know, 350,000 Germans here. 
Uh, we're not just going to dump them back in Germany in a, a situation that's very much in flux. We still needed their work, um, and we wanted to do this in an orderly fashion. So the Germans stayed through uh, the spring and summer of 1946, and by that point began returning home, maybe, but certainly to Europe. A number of them spent extra time in, in Great Britain and France. However, uh, one of the things that happened was that in time, um, Germans and Italians both began returning as immigrants. Um, Hans Fischer was one of them. Um, you may remember him from the uh, Barracks picture early on that showed the dog and the, uh, the, the lamps and the curtains, the, the Barracks interior. He took a lot of pictures to document his uh, time. He was also one who uh, took the picture of the, the model village that we just saw. He knew all along, as a prisoner of war here, that he wanted to stay here. Um, he, his, hand, his family had suffered at the hands of the Nazis, and he did not want to go back to Germany, but that, that wasn't a choice. He talks about moving back to Berlin and just watching and waiting for an opportunity to return to the United States. And in 1948, the, uh, President Truman announced that he was reopening immigration to the United States. And there was a mad rush through the streets of Berlin. And he'd been, he knew this was coming, or you know, everybody wondered. Uh, and so he was prepared. I don't know if he had his running shoes laced up and ready to go, or just faster than everybody else. But got one of those visas to allow him and his wife to come to the United States. He settled in St. Louis and worked at Sun Incorporation and uh, you know, spent his career here and raised his family here and you know, would consider himself as American as anyone. Uh, another one, Giuseppe Zanti. Uh, you may guess uh, one of the Italians. And so we talked about Italy changing sides halfway through, right? He had been held in Jefferson Barracks, and when suddenly they had these extra permissions and freedoms where they began operating almost like American soldiers, he had friends and relatives on the hill in St. Louis, right? Aunts and uncles that had immigrated in the 20s. How's that for life as a prisoner of war, right? He'd go out on the weekends and stay with people he knew and just had a, had a big time while he was here. And, you know, got to know St. Louis and had his family. In 1954, he returned to St. Louis and uh, lived, lived all of his days here. That was a relatively small number of, of immigrants um, across, you know, it's, it, the, the exact number is not known, but probably 10,000 nationwide out of 450,000. Um, in the course of researching this, I pro probably spoke with 10 or 12 uh, former prisoners of war who returned as immigrants and settled here permanently. A much larger number, though, uh, came back to visit in time, right? Especially as they uh, approached retirement age in the 90s had time and money to travel, had a desire to see these places where they had been held. Lots of times there was ongoing communication with the people that they knew from uh, their time here. Carl Heinz Richter was one of them. Um, he had been in Nevada, uh, sorry, Neosho, Missouri, Camp Crowder, and uh, wanted to come back. You know, he talks about his time as a prisoner of war. He kept a real uh, distinct journal. And he talked about, you know, again, not knowing what kind of deal he was getting into, coming across in the long boat ride, getting on a train in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And the train ride seemed to last forever. It's like three or four days, but it just went on and on. And finally, he felt the train, you know, shift off the main line and it's kind of a siding. And it went for a little bit more, and then it finally stopped. And he was at Camp Crowder. And he, he's, you know, he, he said it was very real, the fear that he could um, sense among him and his prisoners, fellow prisoners of war. You know, would they ever come home from this place? And he took and rubbed his sleeve on the dusty window of the train. He wanted to look outside at the people that were already there and see how they were suffering. And two of his fellow Germans were walking by. And they were carrying tennis rackets. <laughs> So it was at that point that he figured it might, it might work out okay. Around 1980, he wrote the mayor of the ocean and said, I have been held at Camp Crowder. I'd like to come back. Can you help, help with this visit? And she said, you bet I can. We welcome you. And so when he arrived, she was there to meet him with the city staff and the high school marketing brand and the local TV news crew. And he felt like a celebrity, right? Um, he got to be friends with the chief of police, a man named George Kelly. 
And uh, I met Mr. Kelly through the research, and he was going to connect me with Carl Heinz Richter. You know, they become good friends because of this visit, and they would travel to Germany, and, and Carl Heinz Richter would come here, and they'd meet in Florida. And George Kelly said, as I was working on this, uh, Carl and I are going to meet in Florida. It's going to be great. You know, we can get you on the phone with him, and uh, you'll get you the information you need for your project. Well, Carl Heinz Richter arrived in Naples, Florida, the place they both loved, and called his friend and said, I'm here, George, can't wait to see you. You'll be down on Thursday. Yes, I will. The phone rang, though, a second time at George Kelly's house that day. And it was the people from the hotel in Naples, and they were calling to tell him that his friend, Carl Heinz Richter, had had a heart attack and uh, passed away there in Naples. George Kelly uh, just wrote a short note to tell me that. He said, you know, sorry you won't have the chance to talk to him. <coughs> he was a fine friend, and I'm going to miss him very much. And you know uh, it's been, what did we say before, 80 years since World War II almost? Isn't that, isn't that something? Um, depending on how you count it, 70 or 80 years. And time marches on, and the memories grow more faint. General Douglas MacArthur, who said old soldiers never die, they just <coughs> fade away. And that's what's happened. And even though there's still some physical traces of the prisoners and the time that were here, um, uh, and you know th those memories and the connections that people made, I think those will always serve to uh, remind us of the, the time that the prisoners were, were, were here um, and the special things that took place. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and uh, welcome any questions we, we might have. Thank you, that was great. Did the uh did they maintain the chain of command or the officers housed separately from the NCOs and enlisted men in the prison war camps? That's a great question, and I trust you all heard that. Um, the way the prisoner of war camps were set up, uh, officers were generally completely separate, like as in completely separate facilities. Uh, but the uh, non commissioned officers, the sergeants uh, and such, did live with the enlisted men and were responsible for maintaining military order within the, um, the, the camp in you know, work assignments and things like that. So yes, the normal military chain of command continued with, uh, with the exception of the complete separation of the officers off doing their own thing. Well, I was just interested was there anybody that did try to escape? Okay. So were there escapes? Uh, yes, there were, and not very successful and not very serious, but they for sure happened. And uh, if I had to compare it to something, I would say it was like a senior in high school in April or May when it's stuff so boring, I just, I just gotta get out of here. And so the prisoners would walk away from a work assignment and maybe spend a night or two out in the woods with nothing to eat, or chiggers or ticks and poison ivy, and they'd find some farmhouse and bang on the door and say, please, take me back to that camp. <laughs> this is it's way better. And it was almost comical when it would happen. Um, some Italians were in Kennet, which is in the boot heel. And kind of like Joe Zanti, Zanti, who you saw on that uh, last slide, you know, some of them knew they had relatives in Chicago. And one guy said, let's get out of this camp. We can get ourselves to Chicago, and it'll be great. We'll just hide out up there, and it'll be great. So they waited till dark on a, on a full moon night down at Kennet, the boot heel. Nobody was around, so they headed straight south. <laughs> and again, that was, that was before the boot heel was as drained as it was, and so they're wandering around in the swamp at night and going the completely wrong direction. Uh, it, that's generally how things went. Um, the, the government's fears of danger and, and mayhem were, were never, fortunately, never materialized. You know, the worst crime that was ever committed was somebody, you know, basically appropriating a government vehicle that was sitting there running with the keys in it and, you know, drove off whatever they did, stole, stole a car. Um, th this isn't exactly the question, but something I did want to touch on. If our government did fall short uh, in any area, it was the failure to recognize the influence of the true hardcore Nazis among the prisoners of war early on. Uh, those were some pretty mean and intense dudes, and it caused a lot of trouble because, you know, if you go out on a work assignment and be too helpful, you know, you're kind of a traitor and too complicit there, and there would be repercussions. So after a time, uh, the government did figure out what was happening with that, and was able to separate the hardcore Nazis from the rest of the population. And 
you know, the, the true card-carrying members of the National Socialist Party would be maybe 15 or 20 percent early on, and, and the rest of the people are sort of patriotic soldiers, you know, doing their duty for the country, but not so completely, uh, uh, you know, tilted that heavy direction. Other questions or comments? Were there any Japanese? That was a great question. Were there any Japanese? You know, I kind of went on and on. You all probably got tired of hearing me say, Germans and Italians, Germans and Italians. Um, Germans and Italians were by far the predominant number, right? 350,000 Germans across the country, 70,000 Italians across the United States. There were only 5,000 Japanese total in the United States by the, by the nature of sort of the warfare and um, just the fact that we didn't capture all that many. Culturally, they did not um, assimilate as well, so the work program was not successful. There was a single camp in Iowa and a single camp in Wisconsin that held Japanese prisoners of war. Uh, again, the work program wasn't the same. They were not ever here, the Japanese prisoners of war. Yes, sir. We had uh, CCC camps in Pennsylvania that played strongly because they were rehab for POW camps. Did they have any uh, CCC camps in uh, Missouri that was used? That's a great question. You know, what kind of facilities were used? Were any of these CCC Civilian Conservation Corps camps used? Yes, several were put back into use. There was one in, in, in Fulton that was uh, uh, used for that up in uh, Louisiana, Missouri with the Stark Brothers Nurseries up there. So there were, I, I don't know 100% details of everything, but I know that yes, for sure, uh, a number of those were put back into use as places to house the prisoners of war as they moved through on the work assignments. Anyone else with questions? Just, were there any Jewish people, were they able to escape through the POWs as disguised or anything? Um, the question was, were there Jewish people among the prisoners of war who used that as a way to escape Germany? Um, I don't know about that specifically, but when, when Germany started drafting people or just sweeping up people in the armed forces, there were all kinds of people getting caught up. You know, somebody who was American, whose mother might be German, was over there visiting, and they're like, okay, you know, you're, you're in. So it was really a, 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 an amazing assortment of people that were sort of caught up in the prisoner of war group. And sometimes, you know, they'd say, I, I shouldn't be here, let me out, and it would work. Sometimes it'd be like, well, sorry, you need to stay. But I'm not aware of any uh, of that specific. Most of these guys were the enlisted guys. What did, were there officer camps here, what did they do? So there were no officer camps uh, in Missouri specifically. Uh, they were uh, officer camps in Mississippi. And I, I hesitate to say this because I got a commission through ROTC and was an officer. Um, but officers were lazy and they got paid a lot for doing nothing. <laughs> that's that's kind of true. Uh, they they you know the, the prisoners of war draw drew salary for for working um, that ten cents an hour I mentioned. The officers were getting paid whether they worked or not, and they would have attendants who would come and do their laundry and make up their beds and things like that. So they were definitely living the high life, uh, but they were so, there was a relatively small number of them, none here in Missouri, and yes, they were kept completely from uh, enlisted people and, and the NCOs. Yes, my, my grandparents, who were truck guardians up in the Sackington area in St. Louis County, had by German POW to work for them. And then being very fluent in German language, they, they got along very well. And when it was time for this individual to go back to Germany, he cried because his lifestyle was so much better as a POW than it was in his home country. That's a, that's a good point. And, and you know, the, the, obviously there's lots of people of German heritage and background, and Italian too, that common connection um, and, and people just being decent to each other generally really played out a lot. Uh, you know, the, the prisoners of war would be sent to do farm, farm labor, which was, as you know, pretty hard work, and the government rations would be like a hard-boiled egg and maybe a thermos of coffee and a couple pieces of bread. And, you know, you can't work all day like that. So lots of times, you know, the farmers or whoever, they would set up, you know, a, a meal for the prisoners just like uh, they would any other any other farm camp, just decent human decency, and and it's that was a, that was the most heartening 
I'm sure you picked this up, but the most heartening part of this for me in doing this research. Last call. We have time for one more question. Anyone? One more? Five? 